You are listening to Shadow Horse Theater Broadcasting. We come to you from the shadowy fields of Minnesota with Dark Pony Radio Show, presented to you by the Dark Pony Players, featuring Nicole Loren, and introducing the Dark Gentleman. And now is, as always, the Pale Lady. <laughs> My children of the night, we have returned. It has been a great past year, and now we shall continue this ghastly adventure. What say you, my sweet? Here we are, my lurid lovely, once again entering that dark forest of Styria. Let us continue what we started a millennia ago with our storytelling. My sweet, how true you speak. The mysteries of Styria keep many awake at night. Perfect for ladies such as I. Tonight's episode is one of love, destiny, and discovery of self, shrouded in a story that helped influence the lore of the vampire for years to come. My starkly stunning beauty. Oh, my darlings, let us begin like we always do with Mystique. Very odd. I've been going through this paperwork from my late uncle about our time together. Yes, Dr. Heselius, the occult detective. Hush! We do not need to talk about such nonsense. The occult is for those without faith. There will be no discussion of it here. Yes, of course, Viceroy, sir. I must confess, I tore up all his last correspondences. Shall I read you of these? Yes! Do you think I want to read these horrific stories? Hmm? Well? It was not a rhetorical question, child. No, sir. Of course not. Now, I must take my leave and prepare for this evening's service. I want all of these notes to be destroyed. You are to have no part in what transpired with Dr. Hesalius. Sir? Yes, child. Go with God. Be good and do what you're told. Now that he is gone, let me see what story Dr. Heselius has this time. What you are about to read is about my ongoing investigation into all things unknown and known. The paranormal, if you will. The story contained in these following pages are not my words, but those of a young lady named Laura and her experiences. Her story begins in Styria, in a home near the ruins of the old Karnstein estate. What a sweet summer day. I love our little rambles about the forest vista. You've always been there for me, ever since Mother passed. I hope I wasn't a tough child on you, asking for you to stay with me at night so often. That is what a father does, my child. I have news that General Spielsdorf cannot come to us as soon as I had hoped. Lord, dear, I know you were looking forward to meeting his ward, Mademoiselle Reinfeld, someone your age, to keep you company. And how soon will he come? Mm, Not till autumn. Two months more? To be honest, I'm glad you never met Mademoiselle Reinfeldt. Papa, why? Because the poor young lady is dead. I meant to tell you earlier, but you were not in the room when I received the General's letter. 
Please, sit down at the bench. Here is the letter. I am afraid he is in great affliction. I have lost my darling daughter. For as such I loved her. During the last days of dear Bertha's illness, I was not able to write to you. Before then, I had no idea of her danger. I have lost her, and now I learn all too late. She died in peace and innocence and in the glorious hope of a blessed futurity. The fiend, who betrayed our infatuate hospitality, has done it all. I thought I was receiving into my house innocence, gaiety, and a charming companion for my lost Bertha. <laughs> Heavens, what a fool I have been. I thank God my child died without suspicion of the cause of her sufferings. and devote my remaining days to tracking it and extinguishing a monster. I am told... I may hope to accomplish my righteous and merciful purpose. At present, there is scarcely a gleam of light to guide me. I curse my conceited incredulity, my despicable affliction of superiority, my blindness, my obstinacy. All too late. I cannot write or talk collectively now. I am distracted. So, as soon as I shall have recovered a little, I mean to devote myself for a time to inquiry, which may possibly lead me as far as Vienna, sometime in the autumn, two months hence or earlier if I live. I will see you, that is, if you permit me. I will then tell you all that I scarcely dare put upon paper now. Farewell. Pray for me, dear friend. This is heartbreaking. The day wanes on. We shall start making our way home. Yes, Papa. A runaway carriage! Watch out! Please help! There! It crashed into a tree and toppled. Let us help. Papa, look! There's someone on the ground! And standing next to them. The woman that called for help. Madam, are you hurt? Who was ever being born to calamity? And the young lady on the ground? Here I am, on a journey of life and death, in prosecuting which to lose an hour is possibly to lose all. What of the young lady on the ground? My child, there on the ground before us will not have recovered sufficiently to resume her route, for who can say how long? I must leave her. I cannot, dare not delay. How far on, sir, can you tell is the nearest village? I must leave her there, and shall not see my darling, or even hear of this till my return three months hence. Oh, Papa! Pray ask her to let her stay with us. It would be so delightful. If Madame will entrust her child to the care of my daughter, and permit her to remain as our guest under my charge until her return, it will confer a distinction and an obligation upon us, and we shall treat her with all the care and devotion which so sacred a trust deserves. Very well. Baron... Is the carriage and horses reset? Yes, madam. I shall return. Papa, look! The lady on the ground is waking up. Where is Mama? What is this place? There was an accident. She had to leave in haste. She will return soon. I don't see the carriage. I will watch over you and be your ward until she returns. Let's get you off the ground and back home to rest for the evening and send for the physician. Papa! 
I'm going up to the room to meet our guest. Very well. Please enter. <gasps> it cannot be. How wonderful. Twelve years ago, I saw your face in a dream, and it has haunted me ever since. Wonderful indeed. Twelve years ago, in vision or reality, I certainly saw you. I could not forget your face. It has remained before my eyes ever since. My name is Carmilla. And I am Laura. Come, sit on the bed. Please take my hand. I must tell you my vision about you. I was a child, about six years old, and I awoke from a confused and troubled dream and found myself in a room unlike my nursery. The beds were, I thought, all empty, and the room itself without anyone but myself in it. And I, after looking about me for some time, crept under one of the beds to reach the window. But as I got from under the bed, I heard someone crying. And looking up while I was still upon my knees, I saw you, most assuredly you, as I see you now, a beautiful young lady with golden hair and large blue eyes and lips, your lips, you as you are here. Your looks won me. I climbed on the bed and put my arms about you, and I think we both fell asleep. I was aroused by a scream. You were sitting up screaming. I was frightened and slipped down upon the ground, and it seemed to me lost consciousness for a moment. And when I came to myself, I was again in my nursery at home. Your face I have never forgotten since. I could not be misled by mere resemblance. You are the lady whom I saw then. I share a similar vision but I recall it to be more frightening. I can't have been more than six years old. When one night I awoke, looking around the room for my bed, my nurse was not there and I thought myself alone. I was not frightened. However, I was vexed and insulted at finding myself, as I conceived, neglected, and I began to whimper. When, to my surprise, I saw a solemn but very pretty face looking at me from the side of the bed. It was that of a young lady who was kneeling, with her hands under the coverlet. At this sight, I ceased whimpering. She caressed me with her hands and lay down beside me on the bed and drew me towards her, smiling. I felt immediately delightfully soothed and fell asleep again. I was awakened by a sensation as if two needles ran into my breast. Very deep in that same moment, I cried loudly. The lady started back with her eyes fixed on me and slipped down upon the floor. And as I thought hid herself under the bed, I was now for the first time frightened, and I yelled with all my might and main, I don't know which should be most afraid of the other. I'm not sure either. If you were less pretty, I think I should be very much afraid of you. But being as you are, and you and I both so young, I feel only that I have made your acquaintance twelve years ago and have a right to your intimacy. At all events, it does seem we were destined from our earliest childhood to be friends. I wonder whether you feel as strangely drawn towards me as I do to you. I have never had a friend. Shall I find one now? I do feel drawn to you, as you say. I must take my leave. The doctor thinks that you ought to have a maid to sit with you tonight. One of ours is waiting. How kind of you. But I could not sleep. I never could with an attendant in the room. I shan't require any assistance. And shall I confess my weakness? I am haunted with a terror of robbers. 
Our house was robbed once and two servants murdered, so I always lock my door. It has become a habit. And you look so kind, I know you will forgive me. I see there is a key in the lock. Please come close and hold me for a moment. Of course. Good night, darling. It is very hard to part with you, but good night. Tomorrow, but not too early, I shall see you again. Young people like and even love on impulse. I was charmed with her in most particulars. She was slender and wonderfully graceful. Her complexion was rich and brilliant, and her eyes large, dark, and lustrous. Her murmured words sounded like a lullaby in my ear and soothed my resistance into a trance from which I only seemed to recover myself when she withdrew her arms. Sometimes, after an hour of apathy, my strange and beautiful companion would take my hand and hold it with fond pressure, renewed again and again. Blushing softly, gazing in my face with languid and burning eyes and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with tumultuous respiration— it was like the ardor of a lover, yet embarrassed me. It was hateful and yet overpowering, and with gloating eyes she drew me to her, and her hot lips traveled along my cheek in kisses, and she would whisper almost in sobs, You are mine. You shall be mine. You and I are one forever. Then she had thrown herself back with her small hands over her eyes, leaving me trembling. Child, what are you doing? Apologies, Viceroy, sir. I was curious. This perversion is not for your eyes. But, sir, it's not a perversion. How dare you question me? It's just a story of love. Love? You know nothing of this world, child, and you never will if you continue disobeying me. Working with me is a privilege. Spreading the faith to all is a privilege. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm waiting. Kiss the ring of God. Forgive me, sir. Very good, child. I will be away for a little while longer. I'm trusting you to burn these papers. Yes, sir. I will know, as will God, if you continue to read this, this smut. Yes, Viceroy, sir. Yes, sir. Of course, sir. I hate you, sir. Hmm. Now, where was I? We sat one afternoon under the trees as a funeral passed us by. It was that of a pretty young girl whom I had often seen, the daughter of one of the rangers of the forest. She was his only child, and he looked heartbroken. I rose to mark my respect and joined in the hymn. Don't you perceive how discordant that is? On the contrary, I find it very sweet. <laughs> you pierce my ears with that singing. Besides, how can you tell that your religion and mine are the same? Your forms wound me and I hate funerals. <laughs> what a fuss! Why, you must die, everyone must die, and all are happier when they do. Come home. I thought you knew she was to be buried today. She? I don't trouble my head about peasants. I don't know who she is. She is a poor girl who fancied she saw a ghost and has been dying ever since. Till yesterday when she expired. Tell me nothing of ghosts. I shan't sleep tonight if you do. I hope there is no plague or fever coming. 
All this looks very like it. The swineherd's young wife died only a week ago, and she thought something seized her by the throat as she lay in her bed and nearly strangled her. Papa says such horrible fancies do accompany some forms of fever. Well, her funeral is over, I hope, and her hymn sung and our ears shan't be tortured with that discord and jargon. It has made me nervous. Dearest, your little heart is wounded. Think me not cruel because I obey the irresistible law of my strength and weakness. If your dear heart is wounded, my wild heart bleeds with yours. In the rapture of my enormous humiliation, I live in your warm life. And you shall die, die, sweetly die, into mine. I cannot help it. As I draw near to you, you in your turn will draw near to others, and learn the rapture of that cruelty, which yet is love. So for a while seek to know no more of me and mine, but trust me with all your loving spirit. Sit down here beside me. Sit close. Hold my hand. Press it. Hard. Hard. Harder. Carmilla, what's happening to your face? It's darkening. You're terrifying me. Please, what is happening? You're trembling. I'm shuddering. There! That comes from strangling people with hymns. Now hold me. Hold me still. It is passing away. I want to get you home, as I'm worried. Oh, my darling. Let us go home. Here he comes now. Papa! All this is strictly referable to natural causes. These poor people infect one another with their superstitions, and so repeat in imagination the images of terror that have infested their neighbors. But that very circumstance frightens one horribly. How so? I am so afraid of fancying I see such things. I think it would be as bad as reality. We are in God's hands. Nothing can happen without permission, and all will end well for those who love him. He is our faithful creator, and will take care of us. Creator? Nature. This disease that invades the country is natural. (laughs) Nature... All things proceed from nature, don't they? All things in the heaven, in the earth, and under the earth act and live as nature ordains. I think so. The uh, doctor said he would come here today. I want to know what he thinks about it and what he thinks we had better do. (laughs) Here he comes now. Doctors never did me any good. Then, Carmilla, you have been ill? More ill than ever you were, Laura. Long ago? Yes, a long time. I suffered from this very illness, but I forgot all but my pain and weakness, and they were not so bad as those suffered in other diseases. You were very young then. I dare say. Let us talk no more of it. You would not wound a friend... Why does your papa like to frighten us with this illness? He doesn't, dear Carmilla. It is the very furthest thing from his mind. Are you afraid, dearest? I should be very much if I fancied there was any real danger of my being attacked as those poor people were. You're afraid to die? Yes, everyone is. But to die as lovers may. To die together so that they may live together. 
Well, I'm to meet the doctor at home. Let us on the way. Papa! Papa! I found this painting. That is a picture I have not seen. Carmilla, dear. Hmm. Here is an absolute miracle. Here you are, living, smiling, ready to speak in this picture. Isn't it beautiful, Papa? And see, even the little mole on her throat. Certainly is a wonderful likeness. Will you let me hang this picture in my room, Papa? Of course, dear. I'm very glad you think it's so alike. Carmilla? Hmm. Oh, I see the name on the picture is Mircalla, Countess Karnstein, 1698. I am descended from the Karnsteins. That is, Mama was. <laughs> so am I, I think. A very long descent, very ancient. Are there any Karnsteins living now? None who bear the name, I believe. The family was ruined in some civil wars long ago. But the ruins of the castle are only about three miles away. How interesting. But see the beautiful moonlight. Suppose you take a little ramble around the court with me and look down at the road and river. It is so like the night you came to us. And so you are thinking of the night I came here. Are you glad I came? Delighted, dear Carmilla. And you asked for the picture you think looks like me to hang in your room? How romantic you are, Carmilla. Whenever you tell me your story, it will be made up chiefly of some one great romance. Kiss me. I am sure, Carmilla, you have been in love. That there is, at this moment, an affair of heart going on. I have been in love with no one, and never shall, unless it should be with you. How beautiful you look in the moonlight. You feel my cheek next to your cheek, darling. I want to stay close to you like this forever. Darling, I live in you, and you would die for me. I love you so. Is there a chill in the air, dear? I almost shiver. Have I been dreaming? Let us come in. Come. Come. Come in. You look ill, Carmilla. A little faint. You certainly must take some wine. Yes, I will. I'm better now. I shall be quite well in a few minutes. Yes, do give me a little wine. First, let us look again for a moment. It is the last time, perhaps, I shall see the moonlight with you. Papa would be grieved beyond measure if he thought you were ever so little ill without immediately letting us know. We have a very skillful doctor near us. I'm sure he is. I am quite well again. There is nothing ever wrong with me but a little weakness. But I have been thinking of leaving you. You have already been too hospitable and... Too kind to me. I have given you an infinitude of trouble, and I should wish to take a carriage tomorrow and post in pursuit of my mother. I know where I shall ultimately find her. But you must not dream of any such thing. I can't afford to lose you so. You must not think of leaving me here. I would suffer too much in parting from you. I have seldom been so happy in all my life before. Come, Carmilla. 
Let us have some wine and think of this no more. Do you think that you will ever confide fully in me? You won't answer that. You can't answer pleasantly. I ought not to have asked you. You were quite right to ask me that, or anything. You do not know how dear you are to me, or you could not think of any confidence too great to look for. But I am under vows, and I dare not tell my story yet, even to you. The time is very near when you shall know everything. How jealous I am, you cannot know. You must come with me, loving me to death, or else hate me and still come with me, and hating me through death and after. There is no such word as indifference in my apathetic nature. Now, Carmilla, you are going to talk about your wild nonsense again? Not I, silly little fool as I am, and full of whims and fancies. It is late. I must bid you good night. Good night, my darling. It's early. Why have I awoken so? What is that shape moving at the edge of the bed? You are so large. This must be one of my nightmares. Stop! Why are you approaching? Please! No! The candlelight has extinguished! Standing in the corner? <laughs> I see you. Who are you? Please help. I'm suddenly feeling so tired. So very tired. I had spent several weeks and nights undisturbed, but kept waking up exhausted. Carmilla complained of dreams and feverish sensations, but by no means of so alarming a kind as mine. I was worried to tell Papa of this exhaustion and fears of being ill, and worrying him so. One night, instead of the voice I was accustomed to hear in the dark, I heard one sweet and tender, and at the same time terrible. Sir? Vi Viceroy? Are you there? And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Curious on how the door opened. Emperors are but the shadows of his imperial power, powers that are ordained of God. They call themselves kings by right divine, but what divine right do they have? I am the one who has been called. I am the one that has divine right, for it is I who holds the power of what is and what is to come in my hands.
After I heard the voice, I saw Carmilla standing near the foot of the bed in her white nightdress, bathed from her chin to her feet in blood. I wakened with a shriek, possessed with the one idea that Carmilla was being murdered. I remember springing from my bed, running to Carmilla's door. I knocked, and there was no answer. It soon became a pounding and an uproar. I grew frightened, for the door was locked. The servants had come running up at the commotion and had helped to force the lock on the door. The room was undisturbed and Carmilla was gone. It wasn't until one o'clock that I found Carmilla at her dressing table in her room. On this same day, Papa had received a letter. Hmm. This letter is delayed. Who is it from, Papa? General Spielsdorf. He may not come till tomorrow, or he may be here today. Someone approaches. It's the general. My dear friend. Upon dismount, come join us. We were just talking about you. Oh. You look as if something has befallen you. I should tell you with pleasure, but you would not believe me. Why should I not? Because you believe in nothing but what consists with your own prejudices and illusions. I remember when I was like you, but I've learned better. Try me. I am not such a dogmatist as you suppose. Besides which, I very well know that you generally require proof of what you believe, and am, therefore, very strongly predisposed to respect your conclusions. For what I have experienced is marvelous. And I have been forced by extraordinary evidence. (laughs) Uh, Any chance you are going to the ruins of Karnstein? Yes, we are heading in that direction. Yes, that's a lucky coincidence. Do you know I was going to ask you to bring me there to inspect them? You shall join us, General. Oh, thank you, my dear. I have a special interest in exploring the ruined chapel with a great many tombs of the extinct family. Yes, they are there. Highly interesting. I hope you are thinking of claiming the title and estates? Something very different. I mean to unearth some of those people. The House of Karnstein has been long extinct. hundred years at least. My dear wife was maternally descended from the Karnsteins. The castle is in ruins. It's been at least fifty years since smoke out the chimney was seen there. Quite true. But since I last saw you, I've heard a great deal that will astonish you. Go on. You saw my dear ward. My child. I may call her. Yes. Poor thing. When I saw her last, she was certainly lovely. I was grieved and shocked more than I can tell you, my dear friend. Thank you. My life was happy. And that is now all gone. The years that remain to me may not be that long. I hope to accomplish his service to humanity before I die and to subserve the vengeance of heaven upon the fiends who have murdered my poor child. How far is it to the ruins? About half a league. Pray, let us hear the story you are so good as to promise. (laughs) My dear child was looking forward... With great pleasure to visit with you and your charming daughter here. In the meantime, we had an invitation from my friend Count Karlsfeld. It was said to be a magnificent masquerade. A masked ball, you know, is a beautiful sight. So brilliant a spectacle of the kind I never saw before. It was a very aristocratic assembly. My child was looking quite beautiful. She wore no mask. Dear... Have you had a chance to go to a ball? As of yet, no, I haven't. I wish to someday. And you shall. I remarked, a young lady dressed magnificently, wearing a mask who appeared to be observing my ward. I kept seeing her wherever we would be, including walking right next to us. A lady, also masked, richly and gravely dressed, and with a stately air like a person of rank accompanied her as a chaperone. We ended up in one of those salons. My poor child had been dancing and was resting a little in one chair near the door. 
I approached the two ladies I mentioned. The younger one sat down near my child, while the one that accompanied her stood by me and engaged in conversation. In the meantime, the young lady whom the chaperone called by an odd name, Malarco, had gotten into a conversation with my ward. Eventually, she lowered her mask, a remarkably beautiful face that I had not seen before. My dear girl felt a powerful attraction almost immediately. I never seen anyone more taken with another at first sight, unless, indeed, it was the stranger herself, who seemed quite to have lost her heart to her. I put a few questions towards the lady I was engaged with. You have puzzled me utterly. (laughs) Is that not enough? Won't you now consent to stand on equal terms and do me the kindness to remove your mask? (laughs) Can your request be more unreasonable? Ask a lady to yield an advantage. Besides, how would you recognize me? Years make changes. As you say. As philosophers tell us. And how do you know that a sight of my face would help you? I should take a chance for that. Years, nevertheless, have passed since I saw you. Rather, since you saw me. For that is what I am considering. Malarka, there is my daughter. I cannot then be young. I may not like to be compared with what you remember me. You have no mask to remove. You can offer me nothing in exchange. My petition is to your pity to remove it. And mine (laughs) to yours. To let it stay where it is. At all events, you won't deny this. That being honored by your permission to converse, I ought to know how to address you. Shall I say Madame la Comtesse? <laughs> As to that... Pardon. Yes, Baron? Will Madame la Comtesse permit me to say a few words which may interest her? Keep my place for me, General. I shall return when I have said a few words. The man in black that interrupted the lady and I disappeared with her into the crowd, and I lost them for several minutes. I thought of returning to my child and her new friend. Before I was able, the lady had returned with the pale man in black, who announced he was to return with a carriage for Madame La Comtesse. He bowed and withdrew. We continued to talk. She insisted that I knew her and that it would be revealed in time. She said she would have to leave her daughter here as she has not recovered from an injury and that she would return in three weeks' time. The lady wanted my consent to take charge of Malarka in her absence. I would have said to wait until we knew who she was, but my child insisted and I submitted and undertook the charge of Malarka. The gentleman in black returned and conducted the lady out of the room. The ball continued through the night. And once it finished in the morning, the young ladies and myself departed. Throughout the coming days and nights, my child began looking pale and ill. She was having trouble sleeping, with dreams of someone visiting her at night. She said she experienced two needle-like points going into the base of her neck. Ah! We've arrived. This was once the palatial residence of the Karnsteins. It was a bad family. And here its bloodstained annals were written. It is hard that they should after death continue to plague the human race with their atrocious lusts. Down this gentle hill are the remains of the chapel of the Karnsteins. I'm in search of the grave of Mercalla, Countess Karnstein. We have a portrait at home of Mercalla, the Countess Karnstein. Should you like to see it, General? I very much would, thank you, my dear. She has been dead for more than a century. I would doubt the grave exists under these stones. Not so dead as you fancy. You puzzle me utterly. There remains to me but one object which can interest me during the few years that remain to me on Earth, and that is to wreak vengeance. 
What vengeance can you mean? I mean to decapitate the monster. What? To strike her head off. Cut her head off? Aye. With this hatchet. Or with anything that can cleave through her murderous throat. Papa? Who is that man standing by the tree line? Gaunt, with a perpetual smile. (laughs) The very man dressed in black. My dear Baron, how happy I am to see you. There is no more time, General. The Countess has sent me to help with your endeavor. The tomb you seek is there in the ruins of the old chapel. Mm. Thank you, dear friend. Do stay close by. I have an uneasy feeling about these ruins. Just in case something is around us, I would like to be prepared. General, could you please continue with your story? Oh, of course, my dear. My beloved child was growing worse. I called for the physician, upon which she had no answers for me and could not help. She had been experiencing seizures and the puncture wounds. It was soon discovered that a vampire was to blame. (laughs) I was wholly skeptical as to the existence of any such portent as the vampire. (sighs) So I concealed myself in my ward's room that night with my hatchet in hand. Good night, Papa. Good night, my dear child. I will be here next to you till morning. Please, Papa, check on Malarka. I fear she may be ill. My child, do not worry for Malarka. I will send someone to check on her soon. You rest, and I shall see you in the light of morning. What was that? Who's there? Why can I not move? What is this creature? Stop! Leave my child alone! Monster! I have had my fill. Pity. A voice. Moharka! Why? Mitch! I shall strike you down! (laughs) I struck at her with this hatchet. But the creature moved too quickly. Horrified, I pursued. Swung again and she was gone. Malarka had left the house. As my child lay there and was dead by dawn. Carmilla! Darling, I was so worried. I woke from a nap and you were gone, as was your father. I thought I would search the grounds for you, and here I find you and your father with this gentleman. My dear friend, this lovely young lady... Monster! General? Die! Take the hatchet! Die! Stay away! Ah, my arm! Monster! Where is Carmilla? I don't know. I, I can't tell. She was here a moment ago. Carmilla! Carmilla! She called herself Carmilla? Yes! That is Malarca. That is the same person who long ago was called Mercala Countess Karnstein. Oh. <clears throat> Depart, my poor child, as quickly as you can. Laura, dear, it's time to return. But before we go home, we must add to our party the good priest. Tomorrow, the commissioner will be here and the Inquisition will be held according to law. Papa, I want to stay a few moments longer, please. I will meet you at home. I just need some time alone. 
As you wish, my child. The next day, the formal proceedings took place at the chapel of Karnstein. The grave was then opened. I had hoped she was not there, but her beautiful features were now disclosed to view. Her eyes were open. There was a faint but appreciable respiration and corresponding action of the heart. In the leaden coffin, the body lay immersed in a depth of seven inches of blood. A sharp stake was driven through the heart of Carmilla. At that moment, my heart broke and I felt the same sharp, stinging pain. I watched as the general took his hatchet and cut off her head. A river of blood flowed out her severed neck. Child, I need you to prepare- <gasps> Sir? What is this disrespect? I, I was just about Stop! to- Stop! I told you to burn these papers. You looked me in the eye and said you would. Uh, Come here. Sir, please, you're hurting my arm. You know the consequences for disobeying me. Get down on your knees. S sir, please. This is my divine right. I must teach you again and again until you understand. Remove your clothes. F forgive me, sir, please. Turn your back. I will grab the flangelum. No, 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 sir. I, I was curious. <laughs> I am tired of your continued disrespect. <laughs> and your disobedience. I, wa I wanted to know more about love. <laughs> Please, sir. I want to have love. Love? <laughs> you were curious about yeah. love? Yes, 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 that is all. Very well. I shall teach you of love. It is punishment. Oh! <laughs> it is obedience. <laughs> it is unforgiving. <laughs> Maybe you will finally understand love is pain. Child? Child? Rest now. Go with God. Viceroy. Oh. <laughs> oh, Baron. Uh, for a moment, yeah. Stand aside for the Countess. Viceroy. Countess. Your reverence is appreciated but not required. Stand up. What is this mess on the floor? Whose body is this? Pardon? Sarah! My sweet child! This was not supposed to happen! Viceroy! Can't you just return her, like the others? You arrogant fool! Because of your actions, she will never experience her true purpose! Countess, she was disobedient. She was meant to be free. If she had done as she was told, it wouldn't have gotten out of hand. Spare me your words, Viceroy. These young ladies are not yours to do with as you please. You were tasked to make sure she took her own life. So she could be reborn. What does it matter? There's always another one. That is no longer your concern. This transgression has gone too far. And I'm hungry. Countess, please. Baron, my dear, would you be so kind to close the door and stand guard? Yes, my Countess. Please, Countess. I know I went too far, but this one was pushy and irreverent to me. To me! Please, you can't! I was chosen! I was chosen by divine power! Please! I'm on my knees, Countess. Begging! What can I do to make this right?
What a bewitching tale of love and beauty of the darkness. For some, love is a nightmare, and for others, joy is the dream. What a wonderful evening it has been. I couldn't agree more, my precious pale beauty. But where do you stand with love? A dream or a nightmare for you? Oh, <laughs> that's my little secret, my sweet gentleman. Unfortunately, we have arrived at that time where the evening must continue without us. Alas, I do love seeing all your faces. I may just need to keep them. My lurid lovely, there are easier ways for us to enter their homes. We leave you all with that for tonight, my children. I bid you all a good night and, and adieu. adieu. <laughs> You've just heard tonight's episode of the Dark Pony Radio Show with voices from the Dark Pony players. Matthew Sachs, Max Bessner, Matthew Kelly, TJ Jacobs, Terrell Woods, and Mara Rose. Featuring Nicole Loren. Sound designer and engineering from Benjamin Conklin. A Haunting for the Ages, written by M. Terrell Woods. Performed by Carnage the Executioner. Courtesy of the Artist. Tonight's episode was an original adaptation written by Aid Hajaj from the novella Carmela by Sheridan Lefanu. This has been a Shadow Horse Theatre production.